Here we see a male resting with two females. But a challenger approaches. The male goes to meet his challenger. And the weaker female backs off to let the males fight for supremacy. Many blows are traded as the fight goes on, but soon the challenger is repelled. Once the duel is concluded, the victorious male moves on into the wild to face another challenge. For the past couple years, I have been really enjoying the Great War Channel's videos chronicling the centennial of World War I every week, and in the spirit of that, I had always been kicking around the idea of doing a video on the anniversary of the first tank battle. No! Well, even if I'm late, it's an awesome story that doesn't get the attention it deserves outside of the oh, yeah, cool type of mention, and is generally reserved to being a footnote in history. So the duel itself takes place on April 24th, 1918 between three British Mark IV tanks and three German A7V tanks that were being deployed for the first time in battle. The duel takes place inside the second battle of ville bretonneau taking place April 24th through 25th, 1918, that itself takes place inside the German Spring Offensive begun on March 21st. The German offensive at ville bretonneau was the first step in an attempt to take the town of Amiens, which would split the Allied forces and deny them access to supply trains operating out of the railhead there. On the 24th, the Germans attack the village after an artillery barrage and gas attack. They bring along about 15 of their new A7V tanks for this attack, and considering that the Germans only build about 20 of them, you can see how important this offensive in the taking of Amiens was to the High Command. With this show of force, the Germans quickly capture ville bretonneau and are ordered to move on to the high ground outside of Amiens to stage the attack. In their way though, just inside the tree line is British Lieutenant Frank Mitchell of the 8th Division and his three Mark IV tanks, consisting of two female, armed with only machine guns, and one male, armed with two six-pounder guns. With the smoke from the gas attack and the day's battle limiting their view, Mitchell and his men climbed into their tanks and are ordered forward. Mitchell's tank, the male Mark IV, is actually understaffed by two men that were wounded in the earlier gas attack. Out of the smoke, the British tankers see a German A7V, nicknamed Nixie, approach commanded by Lieutenant Wilhelm Biltz. Mitchell decided to attack, but had to zigzag to avoid artillery fire and shell holes. As a result, his gunners had a very hard time hitting the enemy tank. Biltz fired back with his machine guns using armor-piercing ammunition that wounded some of the crew members of the British tanks. The two female tanks, being unable to damage the A7V being only armed with machine guns, decide to retreat, leaving Mitchell by himself. It is then that he decides to halt his tank, giving his gunners a better chance of a hit, and knocks out Biltz's tank with three shots. The German crew was then fired upon with machine guns and canister shot as they fled. Biltz, though, got away and survived the war and went on to become a chemist. A few moments after this, two more A7Vs appear, but retreat after a few shots from Mitchell's gunners. Knowing his orders, Mitchell pressed on, but soon found himself incapacitated when his engine gave out after driving into a shell hole and being damaged by artillery fire. This happened right as German infantry began to advance. Mitchell knew he would be overrun, but then, one of the most amazing parts of this story unfolded. Seriously, you can't write stuff like this. Seven British Whippet medium tanks arrived to reinforce Mitchell's position and counterattack the German infantry, giving Mitchell and his crew time to exit the tank and get away. The German attack for that day was halted, with four of the Whippet tanks being lost in the process. Now I love this story for two reasons. First, just how amazing of a story it is. These two tanks run into each other by sheer chance coming through the fog of war, have a historic battle, and one side is saved at the last minute by friendly forces. This is the kind of thing movies are made out of. In fact, someone should make a movie about this. But second is the impact. It's kind of funny to see in a way that years later tanks would be made to fight each other, after how slow and difficult this fight was for the tanks involved. And I think it's very interesting to see how far tank technology has come, from these two metal beasts slowly slugging it out in the mud, to large concentric armored warfare that we see today. When the obvious lesson from the time is, well, yeah, don't fight tanks, they're, they're not made for that, it's not gonna go well. I guess what I'm saying is, it's a testament to how quickly warfare and technology push each other to advance in a sort of symmetrical fashion. That as wars get more difficult, technology is improved to adapt, but as technology is improved, the way wars are fought changes. And it's a semi-rare moment that you can look at and pinpoint where a new idea such as tank versus tank combat was created, or I guess was forced to be created, that later impacted technology and actively pushed the cycle forward. It's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl.